yeah. Oh boy. Okay. Do I click start webinar? <coughs> one then you should, there's a, okay, wait for her. Okay. Yep, one yeah. Second. I won't touch anything. Don't do it. <laughs> Why did I think I should touch something? That's a cool idea. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Okay. Oh, live, live transcriptioning. That's cool. Yeah. Okay, let me close that. And okay, let's get started. And Nisha, can everyone just before we start, I'll present first, but maybe everyone can just introduce themselves and say like where they're from and their position. Okay, so I was going to announce each person. Oh, that's perfect. Yep. Where they're from. Um, perfect. Okay. So let's get started. All right. Okay, so good morning and welcome to the Turner Senior Wellness Program talk on sexual health in older adults. I am Nisha Revere, I'm the Assistant Director here at the Center, and I want to welcome our distinguished panel. Um, this morning we have Dr. Kylie Zetlow, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Michigan Medicine. We also have Dr. Serena Wong, Assistant Professor of Medicine at Duke University Health Systems. Um, we also have David Schlentz, Clinical Instructor at Duke University Health Systems. And last but not least, we have Dr. Alan Cook, Advanced Geriatric Fellow at Dalhousie University. Um, before we get started, um, I really wanted to um, have some ground rules. Um, this will be recorded. Um, please mute. Well, you don't have to mute yourself. This is a webinar. Um, and we're going to have a survey. So a survey will go out to everyone and it's going to be strictly confidential. And um, we're not asking any identifying information with the survey. Um, and so this format today, each presenter will speak for five to 10 minutes. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end after everyone gives their presentation and you can submit your questions um, in the Q&A box and we will read them aloud. And without further ado, you guys can get started. Great, thank you so much for that introduction, Naisha. I'm Callie Zetlow, I'm faculty at U of M. Um, primarily I do inpatient work at St. Joe's and the University Hospital, but excited to be here. I'm gonna go ahead and share my slides. All right, um, Nisha, can you give me a thumbs up if that you can see it okay? Great, okay. So I'm gonna be talking to you guys today about sex after serious illness. Um, as you guys can imagine, this is a huge topic. So I tried to focus on a couple of the more common conditions, but hope that there are some principles here that you can carry through to your own situation. Um, of course, this disclaimer for my talk, as well as I'm sure all of my co-presenters, is any advice or suggestions that I give today, um, of course, can't replace the advice of a physician who personally knows you. So just start with a quick principle about sex, sexual activity that leads to orgasm. So that's any sort of sexual activity, including masturbation, um, has effects on your metabolic indices. So it raises your heart rate. It makes you breathe faster and it raises your blood pressure. It's not a bad thing. That's a normal physiologic response, much like exercise. But it's important to keep that in mind because similar to exercise, having sex can have effects on um, your heart, on your lungs, and, and it can be affected by different disease processes. So one of the most common things that you know, people have happened to them is, is heart disease. And in particular, we can talk about sex after a heart attack. 
So first of all, if you do have a heart attack, um, you may get put on all sorts of different medications. It's really important if um, you're male to let your doctor know if you use medications for erectile dysfunction, because those can interact directly with a lot of medications we prescribe for heart disease. If you are hospitalized for a heart attack, your physician will provide you guidance on exercise. They may or may not explicitly talk about um, sex and sexual restrictions, but in general, the same guidance for exercise um, you can use to apply to sexual activities. Um, a lot of times, if it's an uncomplicated heart attack, your doctor will tell you to wait a week or two. Um, if it's more complex or if you're having a lot of symptoms, you may need cardiac rehab, and then you can just sort of follow the guidelines as you progress through your rehab. Of course, if you have chest pain, shortness of breath, or other symptoms that feel similar to your heart attack, so some people say that they have um, nausea prior to a heart attack, or they get really sweaty, or they feel lightheaded, you would want to, of course, stop right away and rest. Um, if the symptoms persist, call and, and seek medical attention. And then it's just important to acknowledge that after you've had a heart attack, a lot of patients have um, symptoms that can go on to affect their sex life and sexual activity. There's this sort of persistent myth that sex can lead to having a heart attack um, that's rare. And again, if you're safe to participate in moderate exercise, you're safe to have sex, but that anxiety is there both for patients and for their partners. It's also common to have mood changes after a heart attack, and that in turn can lead to effects on your sexual libido. So acknowledging that, being open about that with your partner, um, and you know, getting help if you need it. And then medication side effects. So we already talked about potential interactions with medicines for erectile dysfunction, but medications for heart disease can have effects on your blood pressure, which in turn can affect your energy levels, um, can affect your ability to um, have an erection, to orgasm. So just keeping that in mind, and if you are having troublesome symptoms to make sure that you talk to your doctor, your doctor won't always screen for how your medications may be affecting your sex life. So, you know, if there's a problem, it's important that you feel empowered to bring that up. So what about heart disease, but not a heart attack? There's all sorts of other things that can happen to our hearts. We can have arrhythmias, things like AFib. Um, we can have heart failure. Maybe you're hospitalized for a condition like that, or you have coronary artery disease, but haven't actually had a heart attack. So again, the same general rule, if you can tolerate moderate exercise, you can tolerate having sex. If you're not sure, or if you have a very sedentary lifestyle, um, you know, some people are, are bed bound um, and, and you just don't know if you can tolerate exercise, then that's an important thing to talk about with your doctor because sometimes things like stress tests um, can help determine your risk factor. And again, I just, I really wanna harp on that kind of persistent urban legend, heart attacks are extremely unlikely to be caused by sex. So, you know, don't let that get in the way of you having a healthy sex life if that's what you want for yourself. Switch gears and talk about lung disease. There's all sorts of lung disease that affects us at all ages. COPD or emphysema is probably one of the most common. Um, but any disease that's characterized by kind of shortness of breath at rest or with exertion or decreased energy levels can affect our ability to have a fulfilling sex life. So, you know, there's some different considerations you can keep in mind. One is just paying attention to your energy levels. Some people wake up and feel freshest first thing in the morning and as the day goes on, they feel like their energy levels decline. So it may be that it makes more sense to have sex early in the day. Um, you know, it, some people feel like they're more short of breath in the um, mornings because they've been lying flat all day. So just pay attention to your energy levels and your breathlessness when you think about when it makes sense to have sex. Some people wear oxygen for exercise. You know, again, sex is a form of exercise, even masturbation because the effects of orgasm. So if you wear sex during exercise, um, if you wear oxygen during exercise, consider putting it on during sex. Think about positions. If you wanna have sex and you know it's gonna tax your energy levels or your breath levels, you don't wanna exert a lot of energy maintaining a position that's physically taxing. So, you know, positions like side by side, you on the bottom um, can be better. And you can also think about propping yourself up with pillows, but you, you want your energy to, to focus into sort of the sexual experience and again, not maintaining your body weight. 
Um, if you have as needed medicines like rescue inhalers or nebulizers, again, think about using those before sex, just like you would use them before exercise. The less specific disease process I'll touch on is breast cancer. Um, again, very, very common. Um, even if you've had breast cancer and completed your treatment, the effects can be lifelong. Um, in general, if you're undergoing any sort of treatment for breast cancer, whether it be radiation, chemotherapy, medical, sex is generally safe to continue if it feels good for you. Of course, depending on the type of treatment, you may have significant changes to how your breasts look and feel. Um, and that can then go on to affect kind of how you experience sex. So important to keep an open dialogue with your partners. A lot of the medications we use to treat cancer affect your mood and your energy levels. And it, it may just be that as you're going through specific treatments, you just are not in the mood and that's absolutely okay. Um, Dr. Wong is going to touch on this a little bit in her talk as well, but hormonal treatment can cause vaginal dryness. That's incredibly common with a lot of the medications we use to treat breast cancer. So think about lubrication if that's a problem for you. Um, if you do want to try to have sex and you're going through breast cancer treatment, you know, it's don't push it, of course. Use lubrication, focus on foreplay, things that can help to moisturize your vagina before you have any sort of penetrative sex. And a lot of patients do feel that support groups can be a helpful place to talk about these experiences, even if you're not comfortable talking about it with, say, your doctor. Um, there are lots of different support groups offered through the Turner Senior Center, through the American Cancer Society. So if you're not necessarily comfortable talking to your doctor about sex in particular, you can ask them for referrals to support groups. Sex after surgery. It's a little bit of a different consideration. Now we're not focusing so much on the physical exertion from sex, but thinking about positions. This is of course incredibly broad because there's so many considerations of what type of surgery you've had. But uh, first and foremost, if it hurts, stop. You really have to think about where your wound is. Make sure that you're not positioning yourself or your partner directly over the wound or creating friction over sites of healing. If you have been told that you cannot lift more than 10 pounds, that's very common advice after sex. Um, just consider again, position, holding yourself up, holding your body weight would be more than 10 pounds. You don't wanna tear your stitches. Um, also keep in mind that you may have new drains as your body heals or other things hanging out of you. Um, so you just wanna make sure that when you're having sex, you're not putting anything in a position where it could be accidentally removed. If you have had sex on your vagina, your bottom, your prostate or your pelvis, you absolutely need explicit advice from your doctor about when it's safe to return to sex. In general, in any of those areas, you need to wait about six weeks. Joint replacements are common. With knee replacement, again, we don't have to worry about the cardiovascular exertion. It's generally okay to have sex when you feel ready. You just need to think about position. You wanna make sure that you're not putting weight on your knee, that you're not doing things like um, kneeling or squatting. So not necessarily on your knees, but putting a lot of pressure on your knees. Hip replacements are more complicated. Hips can be replaced from the front. That's called an anterior approach or from the back, a posterior approach. The posterior approach is more common and it requires significant restrictions in how you position yourself. So I'm not gonna go through all the mechanics, but a lot of different positions, including being on the bottom in missionary style, um, would be off limits after you have a hip replacement. In general, you need to wait at least four to six weeks for that position to heal and you kind of get an all clear from your doctor. And of course, if you have any questions, go ahead and ask. So when is it not okay to have sex? almost never, but a couple of instances, if you've been newly diagnosed with a new sexually transmitted disease, and Dr. Cook will talk more about that, do keep in mind that sexual restrictions are temporary, even with things like HIV. Once you're on appropriate treatment, you can return back to a healthy sex life, sometimes with protection. If sex hurts ever, if it's causing you chest pain, if it's causing pain at the site of penetration, if it otherwise hurts for any reason, it's time to stop, troubleshoot, and talk to a doctor. And then again, if you've had surgery kind of anywhere from the waist down, um, wait at least six weeks and, and make sure you're getting kind of specific guidance from your physician. So I'm going to stop there, but thank you so much for being here. And um, after all four of us have presented, there will be a Q&A.
All right, should I go ahead now, Kelly? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Let me see if I can get my screen up here. Okay, uh, can I get a thumbs up if, if y'all are seeing that correctly? Okay, thanks, Kelly. <clears throat> All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is David Schlenz. I'm a medical instructor at Duke University School of Medicine Division of Geriatrics. Um, I wanna talk to you today about sexuality and the older man. So uh, what are the common concerns uh, for sexuality and the older man? Surveys have shown that sexual problems exist in about half of our older adult population. Um, but only about 38% of men, about a third of men have, have discussed these issues with their physician. Um, so, you know, we really want to normalize this idea of talking to your doctor about, you know, what's concerning you. And, and if that includes sex, let's talk about sex. Um, common concerns are having trouble achieving or keeping an erection, a lack of interest or desire, uh, climaxing too quickly, having anxiety about performance and, and inability to climax. Um, one of the major issues that, you know, men's uh, health discusses is erectile dysfunction, um, which is a, you know, not uncommon. About 37% of men aged 70 to 75 have erectile dysfunction. As we get older, this, this percentage will increase. Um, the technical definition, if you want to be technical about it, is unable to start or keep an erection for sexual performance at least two out of every three attempts. Um, I want to distinguish this from normal changes of aging. Um, as our body ages, it, it takes longer to start an erection and there is a longer refractory period after climax. These by themselves are not necessarily indicators of erectile dysfunction. So what, what are the risk factors? What leads to erectile dysfunction in the first place? So there's about six major risk factors um, that we consider. Uh, there's heart disease, um, as, as uh, Dr. Zetlow has already mentioned, high blood pressure, cholesterol, tobacco use, obesity, and diabetes. Um, all of these risk factors, all six of them together, um, are the exact same risk factors that you see in cardiovascular and vascular disease. Um, the same things that lead to issues like heart disease and stroke. Um, these, can, these risk factors contribute to deposition of calcium and, and damage to the walls of the arteries. So the most common reason for erectile dysfunction is dysfunction of the arteries. So the blood supply has just, it's not as good as it used to be because of these damage, uh, these damage processes that have developed over time. And looking back at these, physical inactivity makes five out of six of these worse. Physical inactivity is gonna increase your risk for heart disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol, obesity, and diabetes. Um, if you're worried that you might have erectile dysfunction, how do we check for it? It's fairly straightforward. It's just your doctor asking you some questions. There's a couple of different questionnaires and, and kind of measures that uh, are used, such as the erection hardness score, the sexual health inventory for men, and the International Index of Erectile Dysfunction. Um, rarely, we consider testing uh, testosterone levels in the blood. Uh, but most of the time, we don't need to do this. And, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So what are ways to treat this problem? Um, so in medicine, we look at these things called meta-analysis. You know, we have studies in medicine research. And meta-analyses are studies that are collections of studies. We're looking at a bunch of different studies at the same time. When we do that, we, we get more data to look at, but it can help us figure out if there's, if there's trends, you know, if, if something is truly helpful or, or not truly helpful. Um, so these researchers, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Graugard, I think they might not be from around here, but um, they looked at a bunch of studies looking at physical activity uh, to see what impact that can have on erectile dysfunction symptoms. 
Um, and their conclusion was that physical activity um, can decrease symptoms of erectile dysfunction, monitored physical activity. And they're very specific in their recommendations. 40 minutes of aerobic exercise of moderate to vigorous intensity four times a week. That comes out to 160 minutes a week. Um, and that makes a lot of sense. When we look back at these risk factors, moderate physical activity, vigorous physical activity is going to treat five out of six of these risk factors. Um, and so after six months of uh, doing this kind of activity, people were, were having significant improvement in erectile dysfunction symptoms. Now, what you might be thinking, that sounds like a lot of work, Doc. We don't expect you to do this all on your own. You know, this is hard. And for a lot of people, um, you know, activity decreases with age. We don't know how to get back into an activity routine, doing healthy physical activity. What we're increasingly recognizing is the need to help our patients with exercise prescriptions. And those are really specific. Um, that's kind of a, a regimen of activities, exercises that you can do, you start with a level that you can achieve and, and you slowly build this up over time. Um, your doctor will continue to work with you, find out what's a safe activity for you to do based on your health conditions, kind of what, what the goals are as you progress, as you do more activity, as you do more intense activity. Um, any treatment regimen for erectile dysfunction should probably include um, exercise. Um, but that's, that's not the only thing we have in our toolkit. The next thing to kind of talk about is uh, medications to treat erectile dysfunction. Um, you know, we're all familiar with the commercials. Um, all the medicines that fall into this class are called phosphodiesterase phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, PDE5s. Um, the biggest examples you've probably heard of, they all end with Enafil, so sildenafil, tadalafil, vardenafil, avanafil, it's Viagra, Cialis, Levitra, and Stendra. Um, they work by increasing erection hardness and duration, um, but they can have some side effects, headache, flushing, stomach upset, runny nose, low blood pressure, very rarely death. Um, Patients taking nitrates, nitrate type medicines for heart disease should not use these within 24 hours of using the nitrate. But as Dr. Zetlow said, talk to your doctor. You know, there's not a, there's not a general rule about how to do this. You know, it's gonna be specific for every single patient, specific for your circumstances. Um, so, you know, any conversation about this starts with talking with your doctor. Uh, so besides exercise and besides medications, there are some other treatment options for erectile dysfunction. Um, there's a medicine called prostaglandin E1, which is directly um, injected or inserted as a pellet into the penile meatus. And that has kind of time release effects that uh, for some patients can improve sexual performance and um, their uh, happiness with the outcomes. Um, there are vacuum tumescence devices that help draw blood into the penis to maintain an erection. Um, there are penile prosthetics. Um, in general, uh, patients who have had highly morbid prostate surgeries may be those that are considering penile prosthetics. And what I mean by highly morbid is those that have removed more tissue and may have caused more nerve damage. Those patients may benefit more from penile prosthetics. And that's definitely a conversation to have uh, specifically with a urologist. Um, so there are, of course, other male sexual problems to talk about besides erectile dysfunction. As we mentioned previously, the other common concerns, um, you know, lack of interest, climaxing too soon, unable to climax, performance anxiety. What leads to those problems? And um, Sometimes it can be your other medical problems can actually lead to those. Sometimes it's the medications that are used to treat those medical problems. One of the biggest classes of medications that causes uh, sexual problems in older men are antidepressants, anti-anxiety medications. Um, that doesn't mean you need to stop 
these types of medications. It means let's look for an alternative agent, something else um, that's going to um, continue to treat the depression and anxiety, but have less of an effect on, on kind of your, your sexual um, uh, symptoms. The last thing I wanted to talk about, because this, you know, through the age range is, is uh, of varying interest, is uh, what, what I'll call the T issue, testosterone. Um, a lot of men are wondering about low T, do I need testosterone? And in fact, it's true testosterone deficiency, uh, what's also known as andropause, is, is fairly low prevalence, uh, about 2% of men between the ages of 40 and 79 in a recent survey of um, men in Europe uh, had andropause or low testosterone levels. Um, that's about one in 50, one out of every 50 people in this age range. Um, compare this with the 37% of men that have erectile dysfunction, and we see that the vast majority of erectile dysfunction is not due to low testosterone. Uh, symptoms that uh, could indicate low testosterone are um, erectile dysfunction, uh, decreased thoughts about sex, uh, and decreased morning erections. If, if you're having kind of all of these symptoms together, it's definitely worth talking to your doctor so they can evaluate the potential causes and consider if testing testosterone if that's necessary. Um, I wasn't sure how are we going to do questions, but uh, that's it for my part. Um, so we'll get feedback at the end, but I will stop my share. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Schlins. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and, and save questions for the end, and we'll let Dr. Wong get started. Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Serena Wong, and um, I am an assistant professor of geriatrics at Duke University, and I will be talking today about sexuality in the older woman. Let's see. So I'd like to start with the topic of menopause. Similarly to how Dr. Schlentz was just talking about andropause, women go through um, menopause. Um, for many women, this signifies a turning point in their lives, triggering a new dynamic in their self-identity and sexuality. So it's defined as um, 12 consecutive months without a menstrual period. And the average age for this in uh, the US is 52. And women go through a variety of physical and emotional symptoms. And of course, this happens after a period of pre-menopause, which may be about five to 10 years, um, which also has some similar symptoms. So most people are familiar with the vasomotor symptoms of menopause. These symptoms such as hot flashes and night sweats can occur in about 80% of women due to the decrease of estrogen in their bodies. So each woman's experience of menopause is different, um, but other symptoms include mood swings, sleep disorders, irritability, headaches, difficulty concentration, loss of libido and joint pain. These symptoms of menopause can last about seven to nine years in most women. And like I said before, it comes after a period of years of pre-menopause, which can include very similar symptoms um, as well as irregular periods and weight changes. So there are a lot of negative attitudes about menopause. Uh, in American society, we tend to focus on, on these negatives. There is a classic and long-standing association of fertility with femininity and youth. So it follows that for people who are no longer of childbearing age, they may be perceived as less feminine and old. Uh, this can certainly affect how women perceive their own sexuality and also how their per partners perceive them. Even in the medical literature, which is supposedly um, very objective and scientific, the view of menopause as a deficient state is prolific. Um, in our medical and health focused culture, we are also often frame, frame menopause as a medical deficiency or a medical issue 
kind of like how we view pregnancy as a medical diagnosis instead of a natural life event. So speaking of the medicalization of menopause, um, many women do go to their doctors for treatment of symptoms. Um, some types of antidepressants called SSRIs can help with hot flashes. And for some women, hormone replacement therapy or HRT is an option that is effective. Unfortunately, HRT is associated with increased risks of heart attacks and strokes. And for women who take estrogen only HRT as opposed to estrogen plus progesterone, there is an increased risk of endometrial cancer. Um, so for that reason, we don't just say, oh, every woman who's going through menopause should have their estrogen replaced. There are definitely some risks. But luckily for many women, um, behavioral and environmental adjustments are effective to deal with the vasomotor symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. And these include using a fan, lowering the room temperature, wearing layered clothing, um, and avoiding triggers like spicy food. Another option is cognitive behavioral therapy. This is a psychosocial intervention that aims to reduce symptoms of mental health conditions um, by changing how people think and behave. So this is used for a lot of different um, treatments of a lot of different um, illnesses and issues and menopause is one of them. The research outcomes on studies of exercise, Chinese herbal medicine and um, black cohosh are insufficient to show benefit um, of these interventions. But I would recommend for everyone to exercise in order to improve their overall physical and mental health. Um, so yes, there are unpleasant aspects to menopause um, and many of these symptoms can negatively affect how a woman perceives her own sexuality. However, there are many positive aspects of sexual intimacy for women as they age. Um, many women might report a having a more fulfilling sex life in their older age. They may be less, um, or they may be better at that age at communicating um, what feels good, what their preferences are, and just having a maybe a more open communication with their partner. Um, they may be more focused on their own pleasure instead of the pr pressure of keeping their partner present or interested that they may have worried about when they were younger. It can be very liberating to not worry about pregnancy um, while having sexual intercourse. And then at, in their older age, many women feel less pressure from family members and social and cultural norms that may have affected their attitudes towards sexual activity when they were younger. There are some common sexual problems that women encounter in their older age. Um, the most common are lack of interest in sex, pain with intercourse, and lack of a partner. Um, for lack of interest, some of the common contributing factors can be an inability or difficulty climaxing, um, maybe finding sex not pleasurable, and then of course, medical illnesses like Dr. Zetlow commented on earlier, especially for example, breast cancer or heart disease or lung disease. Um, and some strategies to address, a lack of interest might be focusing more on intimacy instead of orgasm, treating the underlying comorbid conditions or depression. Um, and there are also many sexual health counselors available who can help, um, help women talk through um, what they're dealing with and, and find some ways to um, have sexual pleasure. Some women do have pain with intercourse, and often this might be due to difficulty with vaginal lubrication. Um, and we do have all different types of products, moisturizers, lubricants, um, estrogen creams and tablets, and, and other, um, other things to help with this difficulty. Um, the topical estrogens are probably less um, have less risks of the side effects I mentioned earlier with HRT, the heart attacks and strokes. Um, having the topical estrogen really focuses it more in the vagina. And of course, 
physical mobility limitations can lead to pain with intercourse, as Dr. Zetlow reviewed earlier, changing positions, using um, pillows or other support can be helpful for intercourse. And then also thinking about alternate, alternative intimate activities, kissing, cuddling, intimate touching, masturbation. Um, these are other ways to have sexual enjoyment without potentially intercourse specifically if that is difficult. And then a, a big problem is the lack of a partner um, due to death of a long-term partner, separation from previous partners, um, and different levels of independence, meaning that sometimes um, people might need more support, so they may not be able to live in the community, they may need to move to an assisted living or a skilled nursing facility, and, and kind of being at different levels can affect um, people's sexual activity. And so I would say for people who are no longer with a partner or find that they just don't have a partner, um, going to social events, meeting people through the senior center or the gym, a religious group, um, those are good ways to stay socially active and potentially find a new partner. Um, there are many online dating apps these days. Um, I met my husband through a dating app, so I can vouch for their success. Um, and there are some that are um, focused on people with similar interests, similar ages, and that can, that can be a great way to meet other people who might be at a similar um, stage of life. And then of course, if you are with a long-term partner who has to move into um, a different living location, um, talking to the staff there um, about your relationship and coming up with uh, ways to continue your relationship with that person. Um, it can be just as simple as talking to people and making sure that you can ar make arrangements. So in conclusion, um, for many women, menopause can trigger a new dynamic in self-identity and sexuality. Um, there are many perceived negatives in our society, but there are also some great positives for women in their sexual activity as they age. Um, despite many social societal stigmas toward menopause, um, sexual activity for older women can be liberating and enjoyable. Um, vaginal lubricants and physical positioning aids can help with sexual activity. And then shifting your focus to other forms of intimacy can lead to sexual and emotional fulfillment. So I'm gonna stop there and thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I do see questions coming through the Q&A. Feel free to um, start putting in questions now and after our last presentation, we'll be um, happy to address them. Um, with that, we're gonna let Dr. Alan Cook do his presentation. Alan, you might be muted. Yeah, Alan, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. There we go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Alan, Dr. Cook is joining us internationally. Um, from Canada. So Alan, thanks for being here and we'll forgive any technical hiccups. We're just excited we could do this. Oh, I'm excited to be here. Thanks very much for having me. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about sexually transmitted infections today. And um, it's something, it's a topic that people are going to have a wide variety of different knowledge bases. Um, with respect to. So some people uh, are, are gonna know a lot more than what's on these slides and, and other people might have a, a completely different questions. There are certainly a lot of very complicated topics. So I'll try my best to uh, direct you to good resources to find more information and, and hopefully um, uh, do my best to answer questions uh, as, as, they, as they come up after the talk. So what are sexually transmitted infections? Um, they're uh, caused by bacteria and viruses mainly, but, but also some parasites. Some of the most well-known ones are chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, 
um, HIV and, and herpes, but there are, uh, there's, there's a much longer list. And a great resource for this that I'm gonna be um, constantly referring to is the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC website. And uh, if you're looking for more information on a specific kind of STI, then they have great fact sheets that can be found at this website for each different type of STI. So how are our STIs spread? They're spread through sexual contact with someone who has an STI. And sexual contact includes oral, anal, and vaginal sex, as well as genital skin-to-skin -skin contact. So there are di the different types of STIs are spread through different types of sexual contact. Uh, as an example, um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and herpes can all be spread uh, through oral sex, uh, but there's little to no risk of getting or transmitting HIV through oral sex. And are older adults at risk for sexually transmitted infections? Um, most, most certainly yes. So anybody who um, <laughs> uh, is sexually active as described on that previous slide is, is at risk for getting a, a sexually uh, transmitted infection. So um, particularly with uh, older adults, there are some uh, unique risk factors. Um, uh, studies have shown that adults over 70 have the lowest rates of condom use, which is a, a major risk factor for uh, sexually transmitted infections. And um, uh, there are changes in the vaginal mucosa of postmenopausal women that can also increase the risk of getting the sexual, sexually transmitted infection. Um, uh, the CDC, um, reference two of many, um, uh, has um, collected data showing that there are increased numbers of new cases of uh, STIs in older adults. And uh, a lot of people who um, were uh, adults during the uh, uh, HIV and AIDS epidemic in the 80s and 90s are, are now getting older. So um, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about prevention. The main form of prevention is barrier protection. So uh, the, the kind that most people are familiar with and the most uh, popular uh, use is the male or external condom uh, that goes on a man's penis, but um, internal condoms, female condoms, and uh, use of dental dams for oral sex are also um, good forms of barrier protection. Uh, now, again, uh, the CDC has a great website um, relating to condom effectiveness. It talks about um, how to effectively use um, uh, male condoms, female, female condoms, and, and dental dams, just some helpful tips. Um, uh, even if you're generally familiar with uh, using um, uh, barrier protection, uh, there, there may be certain tips that you hadn't thought of before, such as um, avoiding um, oil-based lubricants in favor of a, a, a silicone-based or water-based lubricant to avoid um, uh, condom breakage. So screening is uh, another important topic. Um, screening for STI, STIs is done pretty routinely um, uh, through blood or urine samples. And it's, it's definitely recommended when, when you have a, a new sexual partner and, and otherwise can depend on your, your personal risk factors. So, and screening is also important because you, sexually transmitted infections are not always um, symptomatic in the early stages. So that creates opportunities for you to pass on a sexually transmitted infection to someone else. And um, uh, moving on to treatment. Um, oh, this is a, another great specific website on within the CDC. And uh, it tells you some more about um, options for screening tests. And you can just type in your zip code and it'll bring up a list of uh, testing sites near you. So all STIs can be either cured or treated. Uh, so it's important to inform your partners so that they can get treated as well, because um, the earlier that an STI is, is managed and treated, um, is, is a really key time to prevent uh, serious health complications that can crop up much 
uh, much later down the line. So although it's difficult, it's uh, really important to try to have an open dialogue with your sexual partners and your doctor uh, about screening and, and preventing sexually transmitted infections. So thank you again for having me here. And um, I think uh, uh, we'll, we'll move on to the, the question section. So happy to answer any questions myself or, or um, uh, any, any of the other presenters will uh, be able to answer uh, questions on, on the topics, so. Okay, so we can move right in if you can stop sharing your screen and then oh, yeah. move into the question and answer part. So I have one person that's here in house and um, she has a question, I guess it's for anyone on the panel. Um, the question is, is it a standard practice that doctors screen older adults for STIs? Not as common as it should be. Um, I think that there's just a lot of um, misconceptions, including that older adults may be less sexually active or in a long-term monogamous relationship, which of course, if you're only having sex with a single person, um, really reduces your risk of STIs. Um, we should just do a better job about not making assumptions about people's level of sexual activity and screen more than we do. But we hope that this talk also helps to empower you to ask for screening and sort of fight these assumptions. Um, we do have additional question. Um, are there any cardiovascular risks associated with vaginal estrogen? If so, how common? I can take that question. Uh, there's very low risk, less than 1% um, of a stroke or heart attack with vaginal estrogen. Very safe. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there was a, a question in the chat that was asking if, I guess you guys seen it, if we're going to share the slides. Is that possible? Um, yeah, Nisha, what we can do is um, email you PDFs of our slides, okay, if that's perfect. okay, um, to you and Jennifer Howard. Okay, so thank you so much today, everyone. Um, we appreciate you guys coming out and really speaking with us today on such a pertinent and um, important topic. And um, thanks everyone for showing up today and we will give you a copy of this recording. Thanks again. Thanks for having us. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Um,